Now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. It took hundreds and thousands of families with children with autism to convince this government that autism doesn't end at five. Unfortunately, right now, the government seems to have forgotten that autism doesn't end at school either. You know, the sad reality is that families who don't have the time that are stretched thin have to come to Queen's Park to protest. So my question is, after 14 years, after 14 long years, why can't this government finally support these families with children with autism? Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, first of all, let me say to the uh, Ontario Autism Coalition, welcome. Uh, many of the people who are here today are people, Mr. Speaker, I've worked with for many years, uh, from the time I was Minister of Education and, uh, and before, actually, Mr. Speaker, when I was a school trustee. And I know that there are many issues that we have worked together on over the years. Um, we have, as you know, Mr. Speaker, we have put $500 million into autism services to create 16 thousand new space, spaces and to reduce wait times, Mr. Speaker, because we knew that there were, there were young kids languishing on a wait list, not getting service when they needed it, Mr. Speaker, and not getting the appropriate service, therefore. So, Mr. Speaker, we've done that, but we know that there's more work to be done in the classroom. And, Mr. Speaker, this issue of how to deliver services in uh, the classroom and make sure that we have the right yes, services sir. in the right place, that's why we've put a pilot project in place, Mr. Speaker. This is a discussion that's been going Thank you. Time. To the supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. The Premier may say they're working with Ontario Autism Coalition, but they've just given you a failing grade. They've said the support isn't adequate. Today, the Ontario Autism Coalition released the results of an important survey. They asked parents of school-aged children with autism about their experiences, about the support they're getting from this government. Forty percent said that their child's potential placements were not thoroughly explained to them. Fifty-seven percent indicated they did not feel they had a choice when it came to their child's placement. Seventy-two percent, Mr. Speaker, felt their child does not receive the support at the level they need at school. That's astonishing. That's three out of four children saying they don't get the support they need from this government. So it's nice to say you're listening. It's nice to say you're working with Ontario Autism Coalition, but their results, this survey says it's not Question. good enough. So, Mr. Speaker, when can we get more than listening? When can we get more than saying you're going to work with them? When can we get results and real support for these families and these children? Thank you. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, parents, uh, to thank the Ontario uh, Autism Coalition for everyone who's here at the legislature today that have worked with us as a government to, uh, to better uh, position uh, young people uh, for success here in the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we've been working tirelessly to put in a new system uh, in place. Uh, we, we committed to putting in a new place and implementation of a new plan uh, in the fall of this year and full implementation of the plan in the spring. Mr. Speaker, we have a track record here in the legislature when it comes to supporting young people. Um, unlike the member opposite, the leader of the opposition, when you look at his track record, uh, when it comes to supporting young people, I would say he gets a failure. He has not. He has not. He's had the opportunity. He's had the opportunity to support families, to support children, and I'll talk a bit about his record in my Answer. supplemental. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. And this isn't the opposition survey results. This isn't uh, a partisan uh, pitch. This is the Ontario Autism Coalition. And so, rather than attack others, I would like the Premier herself to answer the substance of these concerns. And not only are they saying three quarters of students don't get the help in the school they need, you know, another fact in the report read that 75% of parents indicated that in the last year they had advocated for their child to receive support from an EA. Of those requests, 54 per cent have been refused. The support's not there. And I know the convenient answer at Queen's Park is to attack others, but the reality, Mr. Speaker, they've been in government for 14 years. For 14 years, they've had the opportunity to support children with autism. So directly to the Premier, Mr. Speaker. Question. 
This report is disappointing. What will the Premier promise us today she's going to do to support these Very children important. and support these families? Thank you. You say it, please. You say it, please. Thank you. Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, here in Ontario, we have the, uh, the best resources that are being placed to support families with children with autism. The member knows opposite. We dedicate an additional half a billion dollars to support young people here in the province. We have committed to regulating the sector to make sure that the young people are getting the best services possible. We are the government that have moved, moved towards direct funding. Mr. Speaker, today um, there's an announcement made of $5 million investment to further support uh, ABA training within schools. Mr. Speaker, when the member opposite had an opportunity to vote for a national strategy for autism he as a federal failed. member, he voted against he it. Failed. When he had an opportunity to stand up and support he families failed. with Bill 89 that supports young people by raising age of protection, they were nowhere to be seen. What are you doing to support young people here in the province of Ontario? Yes, I'd like to know your record. You see it, please. You see it, please. It's coming. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Since I can't get an answer on the government's cuts to autism services, let's try something different, Mr. Speaker. We just received copies of the long-term energy plan. And Mr. Speaker, I can't find on what page includes the section on giving mega contracts to Liberal donors. We know that the Auditor General said we overpaid by $9.2 billion on renewable energy. Of these mega contracts that companies got, they donated $1.3 million to the Ontario Liberal Party. So was the section on giving mega contracts to Liberal friends and insiders, was that section double deleted? Could the Premier please enlighten us? Premier. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very pleased to talk about the long-term energy plan that's talking about a plan that we've brought forward that's reducing rates for this people in this province by 25 per cent, Mr. Speaker. This is the second plan that we have launched in like the last six months, Mr. Speaker, and I know we're still waiting for one from the opposition. But you know, when we're talking about the benefits of this plan, it's actually bringing fairness and choice and innovation, Mr. Speaker. Innovation that's going to actually see ratepayers, both large and small, see their bills reduced, Mr. Speaker. See more jobs created in an innovative sector that's already created over 40,000 jobs. This plan, Mr. Speaker, is bringing forward prosperity for our province, making sure that we can continue to keep our GHGs lows, working with the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change to meet our Climate Answer. Change Action Plan goals. This plan, Mr. Speaker, is something that Ontarians should be proud of. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you, Speaker. This uh, long-term energy plan confirms what we've said all along. After the next election, the Liberal electricity borrowing scheme gets wiped out. But this $40 billion borrowing scheme is going to cost ratepayers an extra $4 billion long term because it was never ever intended to be an electricity plan, Mr. Speaker. This is a re election plan for Kathleen Wynne and the Liberals in Ontario. Speaker, the unfair hydro plan is yet another bad deal. I'm going to remind the member that uh, titles or writings are to be used in this House. Carry on. Speaker, the unfair hydro plan is another bad deal for Ontario that's going to drive up electricity costs even further. How much more does this minister think Ontario ratepayers can afford on their electricity bills? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So when we look at the uh, electricity price outlook, Mr. Speaker, we brought down rates, Mr. Speaker, by 25 per cent. That is actually clear right as day, Mr. Speaker, that rates are down 25 per cent. Then they come down a little bit more in 2018, and they're held to the cost of inflation for the three years after that, Mr. Speaker. Then, as we said just moments ago, Mr. Speaker, when we were talking about the, 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 the uh, long-term energy plan and, and talking about it to the media and to the people of Ontario, we're going to continue to take costs out of the system. We have examples of doing that, Mr. Speaker. Besides the 25 per cent from the Fair Hydro plan, we actually didn't build new new 
nuclear, cutting out billions of costs. We didn't actually bring forward the LRP2, reducing billions of costs, Mr. Speaker. We renegotiated the Samsung agreement. That's what you do, Mr. Answer. Speaker, is you find out ways to reduce costs when you have plans. On that side of the House, they don't have a plan and they don't Thank have you. a clue either. Final supplement. Speaker, it took this government. It took this government almost a year to come up with this long-term energy plan. It was supposed to come out in December. Here we are in late October, and we get a plan that really doesn't remove any costs from the system. This is a $40 billion borrowing scheme, and the Liberals even managed to break a basic law of economics today. Demand is going to stay the same. Supply is going to stay the same. Prices, however, will shoot to new record highs after the next election. And that's even after they cook the books to make households smaller. The member will withdraw. withdraw. You may finish. Thank you, Speaker. Only in Liberal Ontario is this even possible. Mr. Speaker, we're into warnings. <laughs> finish. Speaker, everybody can see through this $40 billion borrowing scam. They have to stop fudging the numbers. When are they going to get serious about taking costs out of the system? The member will withdraw. withdraw. And if it happens again, I'll warn him. And if you'd like to talk to me and have a debate about it, I'll get you named. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very clearly, Mr. Speaker, the opposition has no idea on what to do with this file. All they can do, Mr. Speaker, is stand up and complain. This is a plan that is bringing fairness and choice. It is bringing. The member from Niagara West Glanbrook is warned. This is a plan that is bringing forward choice, Mr. Speaker. It's bringing forward fairness, and it's a real plan, a realistic plan that the people of Ontario can actually look at and help them understand where the electricity system, where the energy system is going, Mr. Speaker. On the other side, they haven't brought a thing forward, Mr. Speaker, not one thing that would actually do anything to lower rates, but only increase rates. Answer. We've brought forward the 25 percent reduction through the Fair Hydro Plan. We've taken costs out of the system will continue to roll up our sleeves and do more for Thank the people you. of Ontario through this plan. Your question, member from London Fanshawe. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, the Long-Term Care Association confirmed that the Minister of Health has been denying for three days that their long-term care homes in Toronto are looking to relocate out of the city. Whether or not these homes have filed the paperwork with the ministry, they have expressed their desire to relocate, and they've done it publicly. Will the Minister of Health now confirm if he will or will not let any of these homes shut down or relocate out of Toronto? Mr. Speaker, I know the Minister of Long Term uh, Health and Long Term Care is going to want to comment, but let, let's just be clear that um, it is. This is, a, this is a societal concern that we all work with, with the people who provide care for elderly people, particularly uh, frail elderly who, uh, who may need to be in a long-term care home, Mr. Speaker, or who may still want to stay at home and uh, need those services uh, in, their, uh, in their place of residence, Mr. Speaker. It is exactly what we are doing as a government. We are working with all of the providers, working with uh, seniors advocacy groups, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that we put in place the supports that people need. It is absolutely part of that discussion, Mr. Speaker, that beds are being upgraded across the province. There is money that's going into long-term care, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that those beds are upgraded. Answer. And we want to make sure that there are not just those beds upgraded, but there are new beds in communities around the province, Mr. Speaker. So until there is, until there is a formal you. proposal, we're talking about hypothetical. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, denying what's happening publicly is not working with the people of the City of Toronto. The Association's report notes that even the City's Toronto staff acknowledges the possibility of homes closing or leaving. City staff said, quote, 
There is a significant risk in future years of long-term care homes closing or moving out of the city." End quote. With a wait list for care topping 32,000 people already, and now the possibility of losing 1,800 spaces in Toronto, what is this Liberal government's plan to make sure every senior who needs care has a spot in long-term care homes? The challenge is laid out by the member opposite is exactly the challenge that we are working on. We understand that there are risks, Mr. Speaker. We understand that there are risks in the aging population, Mr. Speaker. Many, many of us are working with our parents, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that they have the care that they need. We understand that solving the challenge that the member opposite has laid out is the responsibility, I would suggest, of all of us. It is certainly the responsibility of our government. We are working with the Long-Term Care Association, Mr. Speaker. We are working with providers to make sure that the scenario that the member opposite hypothetically has put forward does not happen, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, this Liberal government is the epitome of the Queen of the Nile. The redevelopment issues with these homes in Toronto are not are just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to problems in the long-term care system. Seniors are facing months of long wait lists just to get a bed, and when they finally do, they have to often face issues with safety and security, understaffing, conditions that do not allow them the care and support they deserve. And when they finally uh, get a place, they don't even have the peace of mind of staying in the city where they get their long-term care bed. For far too long, this government has been ignoring this growing crisis. What is the Premier's plan to take care of our seniors, our grandparents and parents? Because so Question. far, she hasn't had one. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Premier. Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, once again, Mr. Speaker, the uh, NDP is sowing the seeds of anxiety and fear. And I feel awful for those residents of the 20 long-term care homes. We have not. I need to reassure them. I feel compelled to because of this narrative that they're trying to create, that not a single home in Toronto has applied to us to move their beds or their homes outside of Toronto, Mr. Speaker. In fact, I met with the mayor of the city of Toronto yesterday, and we both remarked on how the number of beds for long-term care in Toronto this year has actually increased, Mr. Wow. Speaker, and we're working with our partners. I appreciate the fact that the Ontario Long-Term Care Association, they released their report pre-budget submission yesterday, I believe, Mr. Speaker, and I've gone through it, and there Answer. are some very good ideas within that. We're working closely with all our partners, unlike the NP NDP, who simply want to sow the fear and anxiety among Shame. Ontarians. Shame. Thank you. Shame. New question? The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. This, this morning, the Premier released her long-term energy plan, but the people of Ontario don't need a fancy report to know what the Premier and her Liberal government are planning for their hydro bills. We already know. They're going to skyrocket. The plan confirms it in black and white. Ten years from now, people will be paying 42 percent more every single month just to keep the lights on. The Premier's $40 billion borrowing scheme has seen to that. Even when households use less power, her long-term energy plans say they'll pay still more. Can the Premier tell us why she's sticking to her $40 billion borrowing scheme when her own long-term energy plan tells us that Ontarians will pay more because of it? Thank you, Premier. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to talk about the long-term energy plan, the 25 percent reduction that people are getting now, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to continue to see costs coming out of the system to lower, to lower that for our families and for our businesses even more, Mr. Speaker. I know the third party continues to make their numbers up, Mr. Speaker, and elevate what they're seeing as borrowing plans. They know that those numbers are actually a lot lower than that, Mr. Speaker. It shows it directly in the, uh, the long-term energy plan. But let's talk about some of the facts that this long-term energy plan is 
is doing, Mr. Speaker. We're making sure that we're bringing forward lower costs for all businesses, for all families, for all farms in this province, for that matter. That's being done through the Fair Hydro Plan. We've already pulled costs out of the system, not having to build new nukes, Mr. Speaker, not having to bring forward large renewable procurement, the second round of it, and renegotiating the Answer. Samsung contract are just three examples that we can use of how we've taken costs out of the system. I'm looking forward to talking about market renewal in the supplementary. Thank you. Good. Supplementary. Again, to the Premier Speaker. Hydro rates have gone up 300 per cent under the Liberals. They've gone up 50 per cent under this Premier's watch alone. And now we know that in the next 10 years, people's bills will go from an already high average $127 a month to an outrageous $181 per month. The Premier's first two energy plans had no mention of her plan to sell off Hydro One, a disastrous decision. And this long-term plan is nothing more than a political document that sugarcoats more bad news for Ontario ratepayers. The Premier didn't tell us she'd privatize Hydro One. People said no to privatization, and she did it anyway. She let us down. What makes the Premier think that the people of Ontario give her any credibility on this file? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The only thing that this Premier has done is brought rates down, Mr. Speaker. Brought them down by 25 per cent. Unlike, Mr. Speaker, what that party would propose to do, which is to nationalize Hydro One, spend tens of billions of dollars doing so, Mr. Speaker, and not saving a single penny on anyone's bills. You want to talk about Hydro One, Mr. Speaker? Let's talk about the money that we've used, that we've been able to, to take and build infrastructure with, Mr. Speaker, thanks to the broadening of the ownership of Hydro One. $13.5 billion in the GTHA Go Regional Rail Express. That's increasing transit, Mr. Speaker. I always thought the NDP supported more transit. I guess they don't, Mr. Speaker. $5.3 billion in the Eglinton Crossdown LRT. Um, tripling the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund to $300 million, $1.4 billion in the Here Ontario LRT in Mississauga and Grafton, $1 billion in Ottawa's LRT. Yes. Of course, the broadening and the expansion of Highway 69, Mr. Speaker, making sure that Northern Thank Ontario you. sees its access to this fund. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. Hydro bills have skyrocketed under this Premier, and nothing in her long-term energy plan is going to change that. The people of Ontario don't need to hear any more about stretch goals from the Liberal government. Right now, families are being forced to choose between paying their hydro bills and paying for their groceries. And all the Premier seems to care about is spending an extra $4 billion on an accounting trick to hide the impact of her $40 billion borrowing scheme. I guess we all have our priorities, Speaker. Why is the Premier's priority her re-election and not the people of this province? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Fair Hydro Plan took into consideration every single person in this province and brought forward relief for them, unlike their so-called uh, pie-in-the-sky plan, Mr. Speaker, that didn't even include talking about re re reductions for First Nations or talking about low-income individuals. Let's look at page 23 of the Long-Term Energy Plan, where it talks about distribution rate protection. The Triple RP program lowers the distribution rates paid by rural and remote customers who face higher distribution Com costs compared to other areas. Mr. Speaker, that's a 40 to 50 percent reduction for people that live in the rural and northern parts of our province. Again, something that they didn't even address, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to a party that's actually bringing something for the people of Ontario, it's this government, not the two opposition parties, that one doesn't have Answer. a plan, one makes it up as it goes along. We're actually bringing forward real relief for all Ontarians, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. New question. Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. I have spoken with corrections officers, nurses, and other frontline corrections staff across the province. And, Mr. Speaker, this is what I have heard. Jails are overcrowded. Cell block violence is a constant problem. <coughs> Inmates are held in maximum security without access to rehabilitation programs. Assaults on corrections officers and staff have more than doubled doubled in seven years. I actually met one correctional officer in Thunder Bay who got held hostage. 
And I know the government's saying everything is fine now, but we have correctional officers here today to say it's not fine, it's not adequate. So, Mr. Speaker, my question to the Premier is, when are they going to get serious about the crisis in corrections? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I know the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services will want to uh, speak to the supplementary, but I want to just take an opportun opportunity to say, Mr. Speaker, that quite to the contrary of what the Leader of the Opposition has said, we don't think everything's fine, Mr. Speaker. We believe that the work that is done by the people who are in the gallery today is very hard work. It's very important work, Mr. Speaker, and I would say that uh, for decades has not actually received the attention that it needed to. That is a nonpartisan comment, Mr. Speaker. I think governments of all stripes have not paid attention to corrections in the way that we should, Mr. Speaker. I think there's a lot of work to be done. We have Howard Sapers, Mr. Speaker, who is going to be giving us, is, is already giving us advice, Mr. Speaker, on some of the directions that we should take. But I just want the people in this gallery to know that we understand that there is a lot to be done, that there, is, there are investments that need to be made, Chair, and there are, there's attention to the working conditions of Answer. the people in our corrections institutions that need to be taken into account. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. The supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. Well, if the Premier recognizes there's a crisis, then fix it. If the Premier recognizes a problem, we need action. They've been in office for 14 years, and they're having this awakening now that there's a crisis. It needs investment. It needs real. There's a sense of urgency here, and it's not just the crisis in corrections. In Ontario's probation and parole system. Order. It's a joke, Mr. Speaker. Often the only contact between a criminal and a probation officer happens when the offender visits the probation office. We saw that shocking global TV expose. So there's a broader crisis in corrections. And what I want to know from the Premier, does she think it's acceptable when we're talking about dangerous, violent criminals and sex offenders who are on the loose without supervision? How do they justify this neglect? It was a year ago when we had that global TV expose, and we question. still don't see action. So my question, very specifically to the Premier, is this. When are they going to get serious about the inadequate resources in the parole system? Thank you. Be serious, please. Be serious, please. Thank you. Premier. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Where do you begin? I'll begin with saying thank you. Thank you exactly. to the men and women who work every day in our institution, in our, in, in our community, chair, for the please. great work you do. But let's chair. take a look at what the party opposite did in on Ontario's correction system when they were. The member from uh, Chatham Kent Essex is warned. The Minister of Transportation is warned. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, they looked at privatizing, at privatization our correction system, and I have to say, visiting eight institutions over the past 10 months, this is what I hear in our institutions, Mr. Speaker. And you know what? It was a failed privatization experiment in one of our jails. It was negotiated in bad faith with the public sector, which resulted in strikes, just in case it doesn't know in our jail, and in stirring riots all over, Mr. Speaker. They left a system in need of infrastructure investment decade beyond time is not very good member from Oxford <laughs> the member from Dufferin Caledon is warned <laughs> wrap up please so, Mr. Speaker, we would think that the Leader of the Opposition would learn from the countless of mistakes his party made in Ontario's correction system, but think again. As an eager Harper Conservative, he has established New question, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Parents of children with autism and developmental disabilities are here once again to fight for the services that their children desperately need. When the government announced their new autism program, they knew it would put added pressure onto our school system, a system already struggling to cope with decades of chronic underfunding and cuts, begun by the Conservatives and continued a 14 years of Liberal governments. 
particularly to special education. But nothing, nothing has been done to prepare for that. And children with autism yet again are paying the price. Will the government commit to a comprehensive autism strategy that ensures children with autism get the services they need in an inclusive classroom setting? Thank you. Minister of Education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Um, it's, it's such an honour to rise in this House uh, today, and I just want to welcome all of the uh, family members, um, the students who are here today, the educators who are here today, on behalf of the 20,000 students with autism in our school system. I know how hard the Ontario Autism Coalition has been working, Mr. Speaker. Um, I know that I've been working with them, along with uh, the, the Minister responsible for Children and Youth Services. And, Mr. Speaker, we're very committed as a government to uh, providing for uh, the appropriate supports in our schools for students who have autism. It's something that we know is needed, and we've been doing that work, Mr. Speaker. In fact, I just recently uh, announced that we are beginning our a pilot program that will see applied behaviour uh, therapists being able to come right into schools to ease the transition and to create yes, a more seamless and integrated day for students who have of autism. Mr. Speaker, of course there is more work that we need to do, and that is exactly what we're doing to provide better supports for students who need it in Thank our you. schools. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from London West. Again to the Premier. Speaker, almost one year later, this Liberal government has failed to deliver on its promise to create an education accessibility standard and has failed to provide the special education resources needed by students with autism. The chronic underfunding of special education that was started by the Conservatives has continued under the Liberals. Instead of increasing special education funding to actually meet the needs of students, this Liberal government has cut special education budgets even more leading to an ongoing shortage of EAs, developmental service workers and other specialized staff in schools. Speaker, it's not ABA training for EAs that is just needed, it's more trained EAs. Yes. Will the Premier move forward immediately to develop an education accessibility standard and will she commit to an inclusive autism strategy in schools that addresses the educational as well as therapeutic needs Question. of students with autism? So, so, Mr. Speaker, um... it, please. Thank you, Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, um, the the third party is is asking for areas that, to improve education in Ontario that we are doing right now, Mr. Speaker. We have. We have, in fact, uh, trained 30,000 principals, teachers, education workers in applied behaviour therapy. What we've just announced, Mr. Speaker, is in addition to that, specific, customised Finish, please. Specific customized training for education assistants who work with students with autism. Mr. Speaker, as it relates to accessibility standards in our schools, that is something that we are already doing. The Premier has committed to that. We're working on that, Mr. Speaker. The minister responsible for accessibility and I are Answer. Mr. Speaker, our government has provided a 76 per cent increase to students who need special education Thank services you. in our schools. And Thank you. Your question, member from the Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy. Constituents in my riding of Kitchener Centre often ask me about electricity prices. Many of them have come to me in recent months and have mentioned that their hydro bills have come down. The Fair Hydro Plan lowered bills by an average of 25 per cent for residential consumers and up to 500,000 small businesses and farms. I've also heard how they're benefiting from expanded programs such as the Ontario Electricity Support Program and there is the Rural and Remote Ratepayers Protection Program. Yes. While the Fair Hydro Plan keeps increases to inflation for four years, Speaker, the Minister has also said that the specifics of the long-term cost to our system 
would be addressed in the 2017 Long-Term Energy Plan. So, Speaker, I'd like to ask the Minister, now that the Long-Term Energy Plan has been released, Question. could you please explain how he's taking additional costs out of the system to keep prices low? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from uh, Kitchener Centre for the question and, of course, uh, for all of the hard work that she does uh, day in and day out in Kitchener for on behalf of her constituents. You know, Mr. Speaker, our long-term energy plan delivering fairness and choice outlines additional work we will be undertaking to make our electricity system uh, more cost-effective and efficient, and that's continuing to prioritize affordability, Mr. Speaker, for all Ontario ratepayers. Our government has a history of effectively streamlining operations and taking costs out of the system. We deferred the cost of new nuclear. We actually renegotiated the Samsung agreement. Um, we actually uh, you know, reduced the targets for renewable generation, Mr. Speaker, and these are tangible examples of how we've taken billion dollar, billions of dollars off of the electricity bills for ratepayers in this province. In 2010, the long-term energy plan projected that in 2020, the average residential bill would be more than 200 bucks. Mr. Speaker, today's plan it now projects in 2020 it will be below Thank 130. You. That's a $70 savings for people in Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. For the minister for that answer, and he's right to point out that we've already done a lot in reducing costs. He mentioned renegotiating Samsung agreements that saved people in Ontario. Member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. Carry on. So, as I was saying, uh, Speaker, um, renegotiating the Samsung agreement saved people in Ontario $3.7 billion. Reducing feed and tariff prices saved $1.9 billion. Suspending large renewable procurement saved $3.8 billion. And deferring the construction costs of new nuclear reactors at Darlington, that will save families $15 billion. Additionally, Speaker, the Ontario Energy Board has a very strong record of not giving utility companies all that they ask for. So, Speaker, when you add this all up, there are real savings. But unlike the members Question. opposite, our government is also focused on a realistic plan for the future. Could the minister please tell us more on how he is going to be reducing electricity Thank costs you. in the future? Minister. Thanks, Speaker. Thanks again for the question. Our government acknowledged that we did the right thing by ensuring we had a clean and green energy supply. How we went about implementing those policies led to suboptimal outcomes, Mr. Speaker. Therefore, we took an in-depth look at ensuring that we're procuring electricity generation in the right way. The ISO is already hard at work on renewing our market mechanisms to create a more efficient and transparent system for procuring electricity generation. Market renewal is a major pillar of our 2017 long-term energy plan, Mr. Speaker, and it sets out to fix the foundation of our electricity system and take the technology-neutral approach to new procurements through an incremental capacity auction. That means that anytime we need to secure new supply resources, we will choose the most cost effective option. Independent analysis suggests that about $5 billion in savings in system savings, Mr. Speaker, would result from implementing market renewal in Ontario, and it's through this mechanism we will continue to drive costs down in the future for Ontario ratepayers, Mr. Speaker, both large and small. Thank you. New question, the member from Nipissi. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The gas plant trial of two former Liberal aides heard testimony yesterday that was described as, quote, a bombshell. IT expert Rolf Gitt testified that the province's chief information officer, David Nickel, didn't seek access just to some computers in the Premier's office during her transition. He wanted broad and extraordinary access to all the computers in the Premier's office. Gitt's testimony contradicts the version given by Nichols or by Nickel earlier at trial and in sworn appearance at the Justice Policy hearings. Mr. Nickel, to this day, remains the province's chief information officer. Speaker to the Premier, should Ontarians Question. be worried that our data is still at risk? Thank you. Attorney General. General. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Speaker. And <clears throat> I just want to remind the member that, uh, again, we have to be very careful. This matter is very much, as we know, is before the courts, yeah. uh, and we have to respect that uh, process. Speaker, our government takes our record-keeping obligations 
very seriously. We are committed to being open, yeah. accountable, I and like transparent. And we promise to open up the government completely, and we have done so in an unprecedented degree. Uh, speaker, in a report, the Information and Privacy Commissioner have credited the government for improving record keeping across the government. We sent a directive to all political staff. We have developed mandatory training programs. We have appointed chiefs of staffs accountable for record keeping. We have improved archiving requirements, and we have passed the Accountability Act, which prohibits the willful deletion of records and creates a penalty Thank for you doing so. Days. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, back to the Premier. Mr. Nickel asked for sweeping elevated rights that allowed the wiping of data off all computers in the Premier's office. He left a, quote, erroneous impression with the Secretary of Cabinet, which led him to be granted that access. Speaker, there are still people here today working in Liberal offices who admitted deleting files. This was designed to deliberately thwart the public's right to information. Continuing with this pattern today, the Energy Minister still hasn't turned over all his emails due to the Auditor General. Now we see the credibility of the Chief Information Officer is in doubt. Speaker, to the Premier, why should anyone Question. believe a word you say with your history of dodge, you. deny, and delete? Thank you. I also remind all members, please address your comments to the chair. Attorney General. Uh, Speaker, I just, I, 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 I just want to say to the member, he should be very careful in how he is trying to apply uh, a set of proceedings that are taking place in a court of law as we speak to the Premier of the day today. Speaker, uh, the case relates to the former Premier of the province of Ontario. It does not deal with the current uh, Premier. He knows and so that. the member needs to be very careful as he, when he uses the term Premier uh, and poses his commentary in this, uh, this House. Speaker, let me be very clear. This Premier, the current Premier of Ontario, uh, have taken unprecedented steps in making sure that the government is transparent and accountable, and Speaker, the Information and the Cri Privacy Commissioner has credited the Answer. government for Answer. improving record keeping. And as I mentioned earlier in my question, we have taken specific steps to ensure that there is accurate record keeping in the government. Here, here. New question to the member from Essex. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, today we're joined by some of the 5,000 dedicated correction and probation and parole professionals that are here today in the gallery. I want to thank them for the work that they do, keeping our community safe. Speaker, they're here to keep the Liberal government to its word. Last year, the Liberal government spent $50 million to prevent a strike in our province's jails that never happened. You essentially created a crisis on top of an ongoing crisis. $50 million later, Speaker, and this Liberal government made a promise to recognize that frontline correctional staff are essential and valued members of our public service. Yet, despite these promises to hire new staff, the daily staffing complement has not increased at all. Speaker, what will the Premier tell correctional services professionals today at the th in the thousands that they represent about Question. what they should expect about how they're valued and essential to solving the crisis in corrections. Thank you. Correctional Services. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for the question because it again gives me an opportunity to thank uh, our wonderful correctional staff who are here and across Ontario for all their hard work and dedication. Uh, we had a very productive meeting this morning, and I look forward actually to continuing these important discussions. As I said, Mr. Speaker, I visited eight jails, eight of our institutions in the past 10 months as minister, and I've seen firsthand 
the high caliber of the individuals who actually works in our correctional facilities. And, and I also attended, Mr. Speaker, I had the great privilege of attending the latest graduation of our correctional officers in Hamilton, 211 new recruits wow. uh, coming great. to our, our uh, workforce every day in our institutions. And oh man, are they eager to start working and taking care and caring for our inmates. You know, our government is committed Answer. to the transformation of our correction system, and we will continue to work with frontline staff, Mr. Speaker, and our correction partner Thank to you. ensure lasting change. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, what these professionals need and deserve is not more platitudes from the government. They need action today. <laughs> Speaker. Speaker, understaffing. Overcrowding, broken and badly planned facilities procured from private sector deals, mothballed nursing stations, and only in the case of the Southwest Detention Centre, 17 nurses of a complement of 21 that they need to operate that facility. $50 million to avoid a strike, one report, and nearly daily headlines about jail deaths, violence, and this government has is no closer to addressing the problem. Speaker, I have heard that. Those that are closest to the problem are the closest to the solution. Is this Premier, as committed today, to listen to the frontline staff in our corrections and community safety system, the people that deal with it every day, as she was to throwing $50 million to the wind, hoping that the problem would go away? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Definitely, we are listening to our frontline staff. And, 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 Mr. Speaker, are there issues within our system? Yes. I think we, our government is not shying away, and certainly as a minister, I'm not shying away from that. But this is exactly why we are implementing the greatest change to corrections in generations, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Howard Sapers has fully recognized our firm commitment to correctional reform and will continue to work closely with our frontline staff and other partners as this government brings forward real change, whether it's through enhanced mental health training to all staff or 27 uh, hours, seven days a week nursing, or exploring options to shift the oversight and provision of health care services to the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, or, or through new correctional legislation this fall to further yes, cement and uh, our correctional reform, Mr. Speaker. We are committed to working with our frontline staff. I committed to this, and we will continue. New questions, the member from Etobicoke North. Speaker, uh, thank you. Bonjour, Annie. Bonjour. Good morning. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Speaker, as you will know, Ontario's child welfare system strives to make childhood for those in care fair, equitable, just, and compassionate. Nevertheless, we do see an overrepresentation, a disproportionately higher number of Indigenous children in care. That includes Métis, First Nations, and the Inuit. Speaker, I believe all members of this House value the government's negotiations and signing of a treaty in Kenora with the Grand Council. My question is, will the minister share details of this agreement with the Grand Council Treaty 3? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Etobicoke North for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, over the summer I was in Kenora and I had the opportunity to sit down with uh, Grand Council Treaty 3, and we signed an agreement that would strengthen the relationship between Ontario and Grand Council Treaty 3. Mr. Speaker, this was an historic agreement. It was the first time that any government in this country has begun the negotiations to acknowledge the rightful jurisdiction of child and family well-being services to a community. This agreement reaffirms our commitment to work together to improve outcomes and opportunities for Anishinaabe children and youth in Treaty 3 territory. We're doing this through the implementation, the co-implementation, I should say, Mr. Speaker, of the Ontario Indigenous Children and Youth Strategy, a key part of Ontario's response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to actions. Together with our Indigenous partners, we focus on improving yes, the outcomes and opportunities of children, youth, and families here in Ontario. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I think all of us appreciate that working under the leadership of uh, Premier Wynne, that you're working on different initiatives in the child welfare sector as part of our province's commitment to reconciliation and moving to a fairer, more equitable, more just, and more compassionate system. 
Speaker, I believe that the collaborative work being done on Ontario's Indigenous Children and Youth Strategy is extremely important. And I ask the Minister, est-ce que vous pouvez élaborer sur le travail? Can you say further what measures our government has already taken? Uh, merci, Miguel. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you to the member for the question. Um, as an in, in, initial investment in the strategy, we're addressing the link between violence against Indigenous women and the overrepresentation of Indigenous children and youth in the child welfare and youth justice system. Through the Family Wellbeing Program, we're providing $80 million over three years to address the issue. At a minimum, 220 family wellbeing workers are being hired to deliver culturally grounded and community-based programming. Indigenous communities have, have identified how family well-being workers can best deliver these, this programming. As well, they've identified how workers need to deliver uh, more safe uh, places where women, children and youth can receive and access culturally appropriate services and support. Through programs like this, we can ensure that Indigenous communities across Ontario are leading programs that best suit their needs, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. New question. Member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. The Aboriginal Cultural Security Program for healthcare professionals is excellent. I believe that this training will help us to build a healthcare system that is more appropriate on, with respect to culture for the Aboriginals of the province. Why is this program not available in French? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I agree with the member opposite that this is a critically uh, important uh, initiative that this government has undertaken. In fact, we are demonstrating leadership across the country to provide that uh, culturally safe, that, co that competency tra training, safe and cultural competency training for our frontline uh, health care workers and our uh, administrators across this province. Uh, in fact, uh, over 8,000 uh, health care workers uh, and administrators have already completed this training. Uh, of course, it's a program that we developed in close cooperation with our partners, uh, uh, First Nations uh, communities themselves and First Nations leadership. Uh, and uh, we continue to advance and develop and roll out this program. Uh, and I'm happy uh, uh, to uh, speak with the member opposite in terms of how we can ensure that it's available to full complement of health care workers across this province. Thank you. Supplementary. It's quite good. I think the minister might take into consideration that f some First Nations members speak French and that many health care professionals that work with First Nations also speak French. When will the Minister of Health correct his mistake? When will he respect the French Language Services Act and make sure that this program is available in French? Merci. La ministre. Well, Mr. Speaker, the uh, member opposite and I are absolutely aligned that this is a program that needs to be available to all health care workers across this province, uh, including uh, in French, uh, Mr. Speaker, for those that uh, that is their uh, first language or prefer to receive instruction in French, Mr. Speaker. So uh, I'll, I'm, I'm, I, I know that this is a program that uh, we funded it and announced it uh, earlier this year. Mr. So uh, it is a program, despite the fact that we've uh, already trained 8,000 frontline health care workers and administrators, it is still a program which we are continuing to expand as we roll it out across the, the province. But uh, we have the, uh, the same intent and commitment as the, uh, the member from the third party. Thank you. New question, the member from Ottawa, Vanier. Okay, Mr. President, my question. My question is for the Minister of Civic Affairs and Immigration. The Canadian community has added much richness to Ontario's cultural fabric. Indeed, uh, the member for Ottawa South and myself had the opportunity to visit with the FR community last weekend, and we saw firsthand how rich their culture was. And we know as well that the Muslim community has contributed enormously in medicine, in literature, in math, in science, in law as well. This October is the first Islamic Heritage Month in Ontario. Last year, all three parties agreed to uh, pass this legislation proclaiming October as Islamic Heritage Month. Can the minister explain how the legislation provides Ontarians the opportunity to celebrate important contribution of Canadians practicing the Muslim faith? 
Thank you, Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Ottawa, Venier, for her question. Diversity has always played an important part in Ontario's culture and heritage. Our province is home to more than 600,000 Muslims, some recent immigrants, others with deep roots in Ontario. In my writing of York South Weston, I have the distinct honour to represent and serve a vibrant Muslim community alongside Ahmed Hussein, Canada's first ever Minister of Somali descent. Mr. Speaker, in celebrating Islamic Heritage Month, the province of Ontario recognizes the significant contributions Muslims have made and continue to make to Ontario's cultural and social fabric and prosperity. Mr. Speaker, earlier this week, that contribution was celebrated as the Premier hosted an Islamic Heritage Month reception with community Thanks, leaders sir. in Mississauga. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Merci. Thank you. I'd like to thank the minister for her re response. Government be committed to educating Ontarians about the history, heritage, and culture of Canadian of the Muslim faith. But we know there continues to be systemic racism in this system. So, and we know because we see it every day that although we have made progress on diversity and inclusion, there's still a lot of work to do. Indeed, I think this afternoon I will be speaking to an increasing our human rights framework to support new marginalized groups. And last year, I had the privilege of putting forward a motion condemning all forms of Islamophobia. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I'd really like the minister to tell Tell us what the government is doing to address systemic racism, including Islamophobia, across the province. Thank you, Minister. Once again, Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the member from Ottawa Venier for her question and her advocacy. Islamic Heritage Month is not only an opportunity to educate future generations about Ontario's rich history, but also to tackle Islamophobia. Recognizing that systemic racism continues to create barriers that lead to unfair outcomes for racialized and indigenous people in Ontario, our Premier appointed the Honourable Michael Cotto as the Minister responsible for anti-racism. The Directorate aims to increase public awareness of racism in order to create a more inclusive province and applies an anti-racism lens in developing, implementing and evaluating government policies, programs and services. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to a society where everyone answer. can live free of the fear of racism, hate speech and violence. Great answer. Thank you. New question. The member from Halliburton, Fort Lake Rock. My question is to the Minister of Finance. It's now clear that this government is continuing its all-out attack on horse racing in this province. First, the government suddenly cancels the slots at racetracks program that helped to support the industry for years, a decision that led to the loss of thousands of rural jobs and the deaths of thousands of horses. Now, for the second year in a row, Court the Downs, in my riding, was denied an application for additional racing dates. This is a rural racetrack trying to make things work despite this government's attack on the industry, but they still get shot down. How does the minister expect tracks like Kawartha Downs to succeed when they have both hands tied behind their back? Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the question because we are very concerned about the horse racing industry and its sustainability over the long term. It is why we've made a commitment to provide for $100 million more to support the horse racing deliberately and specifically. And certainly the member opposite makes reference to the Ontario Racing Commission's decisions, and we are going to be meeting with them. I know uh, my colleague, the Minister of Business, Small business will also be in touch in respect to how to provide and persuade and support the industry further. Uh, but horse racing uh, in our province is one of the most uh, vibrant in North America. We are continuing to support them as we must to support that industry, support employment, and support the horsemen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Sir, well, it was one of the most vibrant in North America, and it isn't now. Last month, the government's special advisor on horse racing resigned, calling on the government to, and I quote, continue to fight for the smaller regional tracks as they are the development ground of horses, drivers, and owners. They are important to their communities and are a vital part of the ongoing success of the industry. Unfortunately, this government is busy doing the exact opposite. They say one thing on this file and do another. 
The Rural Affairs Minister pretends to be concerned about the crisis situation affecting Kawartha Downs, while at the same time allowing the government and its agencies to quietly kill this racetrack. It is this government that caused the current crisis, and it is their responsibility to fix the mistakes they have made. Will the minister finally present a real plan to support this industry? Mr. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs is warned. May you finish, please. Just Will the minister finally present a real plan to support this industry, or is he happy just to watch the horses racing die Thank on you. his watch? Mr. Speaker, let me be very, very clear. The Minister of Rural Affairs, the Minister of Small Business, has been advocating and fighting for the horse racing industry for some time now. We're very proud of this man for all that he has done and proud of this Premier who stood and fought for the industry, recognizing that it was lacking transparency, the funding wasn't going to where it needed to be, it was going to big shots in the United States. Mr. I'm not done. The Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs is named. Come to order. Let me tell you, facts still matter. There are several members here that could be named as well. This is very disappointing. You may finish. Mr. Speaker, we are providing supports for the horse racing industry, managed by the horse racing industry, and it's them that matter to us, Mr. Speaker. The members opposite are making claims that would have continued to allow for lack of transparency and lack of controls. The horse racing industry is providing the controls. Yes, We're providing support on an ongoing basis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Earlier this month, Fly GTA Airlines announced that starting November 6, it will be offering flights from Toronto's Billy Bishop Airport to Kitchener-Waterloo. The 18-minute flight will cost $130 one way. For everyday commuters, spending $260 per day for, the, for timely transportation is unreasonable. Effective transportation between Toronto and Waterloo Region should not just be for the wealthy. Residents of Kitchener-Waterloo have been waiting on this government to provide them with all-day two-way go for years. First, it was promised in five years. That was the infamous bullet train promise. Now we have been told to wait until 2024. This government's lack of serious movement on transit to the region means that we have two options. We spend hours on the 401 in traffic, or we catch an infrequent, slow, inconsistent go train. In fact, on his way to Toronto, our own Question. mayor of Kitchener spent two and a half hours on the 401. When will this government fully commit and honour your promise Thank to you. deliver two-way all-day go to Thank you. Premier. Transportation. Mr. Transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member for her question. Uh, it seems to be a lot of confusion in the NDP caucus about this. I don't know why, Speaker. Uh, over the last number of years, our Premier, our members from Waterloo Region, like the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry and the member from Kitchener Centre, have pushed very hard, Speaker, and shown decisive leadership to make sure that we do deliver by 2024 on our commitment for Go Regional Express Rail Speaker. And just a few days ago, the Premier was in Waterloo to talk about a very exciting project, High Speed Rail Speaker. When the, when the leader of the NDP was in southwestern Ontario, it was completely unclear whether or not she supported moving forward with High Speed Rail. We're going to deliver Go Regional Express Rail. We're going to deliver High Speed Rail Speaker. And we're going to ignore the NDP like the people of this province have consistently for more than a decade. Thanks very much. Thank you.
Point of order, the government house leader. I, I was remiss in introducing some friends who are in the gallery, so I just your indulgence. I want to welcome uh, Ekosh Hoffer, who's the chief executive officer um, of Parlian Widow Veterans Health Center in, in Ottawa, and uh, two members of our board, Chris Burchard and Michael Jaffrey. Uh, they're visiting Queen's Park, so we welcome them. Thank you. Minister, the, the minister for the status of women. Thank you, Speaker. I also uh, would like to uh, introduce someone uh, that is here today. Uh, I have a constituent of mine here today with the correctional officers. Here today is Chad Oldfield from Maplehurst Correctional Complex. I'd like to welcome him and other officers from uh, Milton here to Queen's Park. Thank you. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the motion of closure for the motion of second reading of Bill 160, an act to amend, repeal, and act various acts in the interest of strengthening quality and accountability for patients. Calling the members, this will be a five minute bell.
All members, please take your seats. On October 4, 2017, Mr. Chan moves second reading of Bill 160, an act to amend, repeal, and enact various acts in the interest of strengthening quality of accountability of patients. Mr. Ballard has moved that the question be now put. All those in favour of Mr. Ballard's motion, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nack. Mr. Nack. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardnetti. Mr. Bardnetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Flynn. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codby. Mr. Codby. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Mangas. Mrs. Mangas. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Mr. Domino. Mr. Domino. Mr. McGarry. Mr. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Jassy. Mr. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. McMahon. Mr. McMahon. Mr. Naidu Harris. Mr. Naidu Harris. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. No, excuse me. Mr. Fraser didn't vote. Mr. Mr. Anderson. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogan. Ms. Hogan. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Rinio. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Monroe. Mr. Monroe. Mr. Yurik. Mr. Yurik. Mr. Yurik. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Ostroff. Mr. Ostroff. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Sattler. Mr. Sattler. Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor. Mr. Nadishak. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 49, the nays are 33. The ayes being 49, the nays being 33, I declare the motion carried. Mr. Chan has moved second reading of Bill 160, an act to amend, repeal, and act various acts in interest of strengthening quality and accountability for patients. Is it the pleasure of the House the motion carried? I heard a no. All those in favor, please, uh, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say nay. In my opinion, the eyes have it. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bell. inappropriate. Mr. Chan has moved second reading of Bill 160, an act to amend, repeal, and enact various acts in interest of strengthening quality and accountability for patients. All those in favor, please rise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Nacky. Mr. Nacky. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Carr. Mr. Takar. Mr. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardnetti. Mr. Bardnetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. 
Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Domerle. Ms. Domerle. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Mrs. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Rinio. Ms. Rinio. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardy. Mr. Hardy. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Tabins. Mr. Tabins. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Natashak. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Shimanta. Ms. Shimanta. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 69, the nays are 13. The ayes being 69, the nays being 13, I declare the motion carried. Shall the bill be ordered for third reading? Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Thank you. I apologize, Mr. Speaker. I'd ask that the bill be referred to the Standing Committee on General Government. There being no further de deferred votes, this House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.